Book One, Chapter Five of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book One, Alison Device. Chapter Five, Mother Chattox. Not far from the green where the May Day revels were held, stood the ancient parish church of Whaley, its square tower surmounted with a flagstaff and a banner, and shaking with the joyous peals of the ringers. A picturesque and beautiful structure it was, though full of architectural incongruities, and its grey walls and hoary buttresses, with the lancet-shaped windows of the choir and the ramified tracery of the fine eastern window, could not fail to please any taste not quite so critical as to require absolute harmony and perfection in a building. Parts of the venerable fabric were older than the abbey itself, dating back as far as the eleventh century, when a chapel occupied the site, and though many alterations had been made in the subsequent structure at various times, and many beauties destroyed, especially during the period of the Reformation, enough of its pristine character remained to render it a very good specimen of an old country church. Internally, the cylindrical columns of the north aisle, the construction of the choir, and the three stone seats supported on rounded columns near the altar proclaimed its high antiquity. Within the choir were preserved the eighteen richly carved stalls, once occupying a similar position in the desecrated conventual church, and though exquisite in themselves, they seemed here sadly out of place, not being proportionate to the structure. Their elaborately carved seats projected far into the body of the church, and their crocketed pinnacles shot up almost to the ceiling. But it was well that they had not shared the destruction in which almost all the other ornaments of the magnificent fane they once decorated were involved. Carefully preserved, the black varnished oak, well displayed the quaint and grotesque designs with which many of them, the prior's stall in especial, were embellished. Chief among them was the abbot's stall, festooned with sculptured vine-wreaths and clustering grapes, and bearing the auspicious inscription, Semper Gaudentes, Sintiste Serve Seventes, singularly inapplicable, however, to the last prelate who filled it, some fine old monuments and warlike trophies of neighbouring wealthy families adorned the walls, and within the nave was a magnificent pew with a canopy and pillars of elaborately carved oak, and lattice-work at the sides, allocated to the manor of reed, and recently erected by Roger Nowell, while in the north and south aisles were two small chapels, converted, since the reformed faith had obtained, into pews, the one called St. Mary's Cage, belonging to the Asherton family, and the other appertaining to the catterals of Little Mitten, and designated St. Nicholas's Cage. Under the last-named chapel were interred some of the Paslews of Wiswell, and here lay the last unfortunate abbot of Whaley, between whose grave and the Asherton and Bradill families a fatal relation was supposed to subsist. Another large pew, allocated to the Townleys, and designated St. Anthony's Cage, was rendered remarkable by a characteristic speech of Sir John Townley, which gave much offence to the neighbouring dames. Called upon to decide as to the position of the sittings in the church, the discourteous knight made choice of St. Anthony's Cage already mentioned, declaring, "'My man Shuttleworth of Hacking made this form, and here will I sit when I come, and my cousin Noel may make a seat behind me, if he please, and my son Sherburne shall make one on the other side.' and Master Catterall another behind him, and for the residue the use shall be first come first speed, and that will make the proud wives of Whaley rise betimes to come to church. One can fancy the rough knight's chuckle as he addressed these words to the old clerk, certain of their being quickly repeated to the proud wives in question. Within the churchyard grew two fine old yew-trees, now long since decayed and gone, but then spreading their dark green arms over the little turf-covered graves. Reared against the buttresses of the church was an old stone coffin, together with a fragment of a curious monumental effigy, likewise of stone, but the most striking objects in the place, and deservedly ranked among the wonders of Whaley, were three remarkable obelisk-shaped crosses, 
set in a line upon pedestals, covered with singular devices in fretwork, and all three differing in size and design. Evidently of the remotest antiquity, these crosses were traditionally assigned to Paulinus, who, according to the Venerable Bede, first preached the gospel in these parts, in the early part of the seventh century. But other legends were attached to them by the vulgar, and dim mystery brooded over them. Vestiges of another people and another faith were likewise here discernible, for where the Saxon forefathers of the village prayed and slumbered in death, the Roman invaders of the isle had trodden, and perchance performed their religious rites, some traces of an encampment being found in the churchyard by the historian of the spot, while the north boundary of the hallowed precincts was formed by a deep fosse, once encompassing the nigh-obliterated fortification. Besides these records of an elder people, there was another memento of bygone days and creeds, in a little hermitage and chapel adjoining it, founded in the reign of Edward the Third by Henry, Duke of Lancaster, for the support of two recluses and a priest to say masses daily for him and his descendants. That this pious bequest, being grievously abused in the subsequent reign of Henry the Sixth by Isolde de Heaton, a fair widow, who, in the first transports of grief, vowing herself to heaven, took up her abode in the hermitage, and led a very disorderly life therein, to the great scandal of the abbey, and the great prejudice of the morals of its brethren, and at last, tired even of the slight restraint imposed upon her, fled away, contrary to her oath and profession, not willing nor intending to be restored again. The hermitage was dissolved by the pious monarch, and masses ordered to be said daily in the parish church for the repose of the soul of the founder. Such was the legend attached to the little cell, and tradition went on to say that the anchoress broke her leg in crossing Whaley Nab, and limped ever afterwards, a just judgment on such a heinous offender. Both these little structures were picturesque objects, being overgrown with ivy and woodbine. The chapel was completely in ruins, while the cell, profaned by the misdoings of the dissolute votary Cecola, had been converted into a cage for vagrants and offenders, and made secure by a grated window and a strong door studded with broad-headed nails. The view from the churchyard, embracing the vicarage house, a comfortable residence, surrounded by a large walled-in garden, well stocked with fruit-trees, and sheltered by a fine grove of rook-haunted timber, extended on the one hand over the village, and on the other over the abbey, and was bounded by the towering and well-wooded heights of Whaley Nab. On the side of the abbey, the most conspicuous objects were the great north-eastern gateway, with the ruined conventual church. Ever beautiful, the view was especially so on the present occasion, from the animated scene combined with it, and the pleasant prospect was enjoyed by a large assemblage, who had adjourned thither to witness the concluding part of the festival. Within the green and flower-decked bowers, which, as has been before mentioned, were erected in the churchyard, were seated Dr. Ormerod and Sir Ralph Asherton, with such of their respective guests as had not already retired, including Richard and Nicholas Asherton, both of whom had returned from the Abbey, the former having been dismissed by Lady Asherton from further attendance upon Alison, and the latter having concluded his discourse with Parson Dewhurst, who indeed accompanied him to the church, and was now placed between the vicar and the rector of Middleton. From this gentle elevation the gay company on the green could be fully discerned, the tall maypole, with its garlands and ribbons, forming a pivot about which the throng ever revolved, while stationary amidst the moving masses the rush-cart reared on high its broad green back, as if to resist the living waves constantly dashed against it. By and by a new kind of movement was perceptible, and it soon became evident that a procession was being formed. Immediately afterwards the rush-cart was put in motion, and winded slowly along the narrow street leading to the church, preceded by the Morris dancers and the other May Day revellers, and followed by a great concourse of people shouting, dancing, and singing. On came the crowd. The jingling of bells and the sound of music grew louder and louder, and the procession, lost for a while behind some intervening habitations, though the men bestriding the rush-cart could be discerned over their summits, burst suddenly into view, 
and the revellers entering the churchyard drew up on either side of the little path leading to the porch, while the rush-cart, coming up the next moment, stopped at the gate. Then four young maidens, dressed in white, and having baskets in their hands, advanced and scattered flowers along the path, after which ladders were reared against the sides of the rush-cart, and the men, descending from their exalted position, bore the garlands to the church, preceded by the vicar and the two other divines, and followed by Robin Hood and his band, the Morris dancers, and a troop of little children singing a hymn. The next step was to unfasten the bundles of rushes, of which the cart was composed, and this was very quickly and skilfully performed, the utmost care being taken of the trinkets and valuables with which it was ornamented. These were gathered together in baskets, and conveyed to the vestry, and there locked up. This done, the bundles of rushes were taken up by several old women, who strewed the aisles with them, and placed such as had been tied up as mats in the pews. At the same time, two casks of ale, set near the gate, and given for the occasion by the vicar, were broached, and their foaming contents freely distributed among the dancers and the thirsty crowd. Very merry were they, as may be supposed, in consequence, but their mirth was happily kept within due limits of decorum. When the rush-cart was well-nigh unladen, Richard Asherton entered the church, and greatly pleased with the effect of the flowery garlands with which the various pews were decorated, said as much to the vicar, who smilingly replied that he was glad to find he approved of the practice, even though it might savour of superstition. And as the good doctor walked away, being called forth, the young man almost unconsciously turned into the chapel on the north aisle. Here he stood for a few moments, gazing round the church, wrapped in pleasing meditation, in which many objects, somewhat foreign to the place and time, passed through his mind, when, chancing to look down, he saw a small funeral wreath, of mingled yew and cypress, lying at his feet, and a slight tremor passed over his frame, as he found he was standing on the ill-omened grave of Abbot Pasnew. Before he could ask himself by whom this sad garland had been so deposited, Nicholas Asherton came up to him, and with a look of great uneasiness cried, "'Come away instantly, Dick. Do you know where you are standing?' "'On the grave of the last abbot of Whaley,' replied Richard, smiling. "'Have you forgotten the common saying?' cried Nicholas, "'that the Asherton who stands on that unlucky grave shall die within the year? Come away at once.' Oh, "'It is too late,' replied Richard. "'I have incurred the fate, if such a fate be attached to the tomb, and as my moving away will not preserve me, so my tarrying here cannot injure me further. But I have no fear.' "'You have more courage than I possess,' rejoined Nicholas. "'I would not set foot on that accursed stone for half the county. "'Its malign influence on our house has been proved too often. "'The first to experience the fatal destiny were Richard Asherton and John Bradill, "'the purchasers of the Abbey. "'Both met here together on the anniversary of the Abbot's execution, "'some forty years after its occurrence, it is true, "'and when they were both pretty well stricken in years.' and within that year, namely 1578, both died, and were buried in the vault on the opposite side of the church, not many paces from their old enemy. The last instance was my poor brother Richard, who, being incredulous as you are, was resolved to brave the destiny, and stationed himself upon the tomb during divine service. But he, too, died within the appointed time, "'He was bewitched to death, at least so it is affirmed,' said Richard Asherton, with a smile. "'But I believe in one evil influence just as much as in the other. "'It matters not how the destiny be accomplished, so it came to pass,' rejoined the squire, turning away. "'Heaven shield you from it.' "'Stay,' said Richard, picking up the wreath. "'Who think you can have placed this funeral garland on the abbot's grave?' Oh, "'I cannot guess,' cried Nicholas staring at it in amazement. "'An enemy of ours, most likely. It is neither customary nor lawful in our Protestant country so to ornament graves. Put it down, Dick.' Oh, "'I shall not displace it, certainly,' replied Richard, laying it down again. "'But I as little think it has been placed here by a hostile hand as I do that harm will ensure to me from standing here. To relieve your anxiety, however, I will come forth,' he added, stepping into the aisle. "'Why should an enemy deposit a garland on the abbot's tomb, 
since it was by mere chance that it hath met my eyes. "'Mere chance?' cried Nicholas. "'Everything is mere chance with you philosophers. There is more than chance in it. My mind misgives me strangely. That terrible old Abbot Pasteur is as troublesome to us in death as he was during life to our predecessor Richard Ashton. Not content with making his tombstone a weapon of destruction to us, he pays the Abbey itself an occasional visit, and his appearance always betides some disaster to the family. Oh, I have never seen him myself, and I trust I never shall. But other people have, and have been nice scared out of their senses by the apparition. Idle tales. The invention of overheated brains, rejoined Richard. Trust me. The abbot's rest will not be broken till the day when all shall rise from their tombs, though if ever the dead, supposing such a thing possible, could be justified in injuring and affrighting the living, it might be in his case, since he mainly owed his destruction to our ancestor. On the same principle it has been held that the church lands are unlucky to their lay possessors. But see how this superstitious notion has been disproved in our own family, to whom Whaley Abbey and its domains have brought wealth, power, and worldly happiness. "'There is something in the notion, nevertheless,' replied Nicholas, "'and though our case may, I hope, continue an exception to the rule, most grantees of ecclesiastical houses have found them a curse, and the time may come when the abbess may prove so to our descendants.' But without discussing the point, there is one instance in which the malignant influence of the vindictive abbot has undoubtedly extended long after his death. You have heard, I suppose, that he pronounced a dreadful anathema on the child of a man who had the reputation of being a wizard, and who afterwards acted as his executioner. I know not the whole particulars of the dark story, but I know that Pasley fixed a curse upon the child, declaring it should become a witch and the mother of witches and the prediction has been verified. Nigh eighty years have flown by since then, and the infant still lives, a fearful and mischievous witch, and all her family are similarly fated. All are witches. I never heard the story before, said Richard, somewhat thoughtfully, but I guess to whom you allude, Mother Demdike of Pendle Forest and her family. Precisely, rejoined Nicholas, they are a brood of witches. "'In that case, Alison Device must be a witch,' cried Richard, "'and I think you will hardly venture upon such an assertion "'after what you have seen of her to-day. "'If she be a witch, I would there were many such as fair and gentle, "'and see you not how easily the matter is explained. "'Give a dog an ill name and hang him, "'a proverb with which you are familiar enough. "'So with Mother Demdike, whether really uttered or not, the abbot's curse upon her and her issue has been bruited abroad, and hence she is made a witch, and her children are supposed to inherit the infamous taint. So it is with you, Tomb. It is said to be dangerous to our family, and dangerous no doubt it is to those who believe in the saying, which luckily I do not. The prophecy works its own fulfilment. The absurdity and injustice of yielding to the opinion are manifest. No wrong can have been done the abbot by Mother Demdike any more than by her children, and yet they are to be punished for the misdeeds of their predecessor. Aye, as you and I, or of the third and fourth generation, may be punished for the sins of our fathers, rejoined Nicholas. You have scripture against you, Dick. The only thing I see in favour of your argument is the instance you allege of Alison. She does not look like a witch, certainly, but there is no saying she may only be the more dangerous for her rare beauty and apparent innocence. "'I would answer for her truth in my life,' cried Richard quickly. "'It is impossible to look at her countenance, in which candour and purity shine forth, and doubt her goodness.' "'She has scattered her spells over you, Dick, that's certain,' rejoined Nicholas, laughing. "'But to be serious, Alison, I admit, is an exception to the rest of the family, but that only strengthens the general rule. Did you ever remark the strange look they all have, save the fair maid in question, have about the eyes? Richard answered in the negative. It is very singular, and I wonder you have not noticed it, pursued Nicholas, but the question of reputed witchcraft in Mother Demdike has some chance of being speedily settled. For Master Potts, the little London lawyer who goes with us to Pendle Forest to-morrow, is about to have her arrested and examined before a magistrate. Indeed? exclaimed Richard. This must be prevented. 
"'Why so?' exclaimed Nicholas, in surprise. "'Because the prejudice existing against her is sure to convict and destroy her,' replied Richard. "'Her great age, infirmities, and poverty will be proofs against her. How can she, or any old enfeebled creature like her, whose decrepitude and misery should move compassion rather than excite fear, how can such a person defend herself against charges easily made and impossible to refute?' "'I do not deny the possibility of witchcraft, even in our own days, though I think it a very unlikely occurrence. But I would determinedly resist giving credit to any tales told by the superstitious vulgar, who, naturally prone to cruelty, have so many motives for avenging imaginary wrongs. It is placing a dreadful weapon in their hands, of which they have cunning enough to know the use, but neither mercy nor justice enough to restrain them from using it.' "'Better let one guilty person escape than many innocent perish. "'So many undefined charges have been brought against Mother Demdike "'that at last they have fixed a stigma on her name, "'and made her an object of dread and superstition. "'She is endowed with mysterious power, "'which would have no effect if not believed in, "'and now must be burned because she is called a witch, "'and is doting and vain enough to accept the title. "'There is something in a witch difficult say almost impossible to describe said nicholas but you cannot be mistaken about her by her general ill course of life by repeated sets of mischief and by threats followed by the consequences menaced she becomes known there is much mystery in the matter not permitted human knowledge entirely to penetrate but as we know from the scriptures that the sin of witchcraft did exist and as we have no evidence it has ceased so it is fair to conclude that there may be practices of the dark offence in our own days, and such I hold to be Mother Demdike and Mother Chattox, rival potentates in evil, they contend which shall do most mischief, but it must be admitted the former bears away the bell. If all the ill attributed to her were really caused by her machinations, this might be correct, replied Richard, but it only shows her to be more calumnated than the other. "'In a word, cousin Nicholas, I look upon them as two poor old creatures who, persuaded they really possess their supernatural power accorded to them by the vulgar, strive to act up to their parts, and are mainly assisted in doing so by the credulity and fears of their audience.' "'Admitting the blind credulity of the multitude,' said Nicholas, "'and their proneness to discern the hand of the witch in the most trifling accidents,' admitting also their readiness to accuse any old crone unlucky enough to offend them of sorcery, I still believe there are actual practices of the black art, who for a brief term of power have entered into a league with Satan, worship him, and attend his sabbaths, and have a familiar in the shape of a cat, dog, toad, or mole to obey their behests, transform themselves into various shapes, as a hound, a horse, or hare, raise storms of wind or hail, maim cattle, bewitch, and slay human beings, and ride whither they will on broomsticks. But holding the contrary opinion, you will not, I apprehend, aid Master Potts in his quest of witches. I will not, rejoined Richard. On the contrary, I will oppose him. But enough of this. Let us go forth. And they quitted the church together. As they issued into the churchyard, they found the principal arbours occupied by the Morris dancers, Robin Hood and his troop, Dr. Ormerod and Sir Ralph having retired to the vicarage house. Many merry groups were scattered about, talking, laughing, and singing. But two persons, seemingly objects of suspicion and alarm, and shunned by every one who crossed their path, were advancing slowly towards the three crosses of Paulinus, which stood in a line not far from the church porch. They were females, one about five-and-twenty, very comely, and habited in smart holiday attire, put on with considerable rustic coquetry, so as to display a very neat foot and ankle, and with plenty of ribbons in her fine chestnut hair. The other was a very different person, far advanced in years, bent almost double, palsy-stricken, her arms and limbs shaking, her head nodding, her chin wagging, her snowy locks hanging about her wrinkled visage her brows and upper lip frore, and her eyes almost sightless, the pupils being cased with a thin white film. Her dress, of antiquated make and faded stuff, had once been deep red in colour, and her old black hat was high-crowned and broad-brimmed. 
she partly aided herself in walking with a crutch-handled stick, and partly leant upon her younger companion for support. "'Why, there is one of the old women we have just been speaking of, Mother Chattox," said Richard, pointing them out, "'and with her her granddaughter, pretty Nance Redfern.' "'So it is,' cried Nicholas. "'What makes the old hag here, I marvel. I will go question her.' So saying, he strode quickly towards her. "'How now, Mother Chattox? he cried. "'What mischief is afoot? What makes the darkness-loving owl abroad in the glare of day? What brings the grisly she-wolf from her forest lair? Back to thy den, old witch! Art crazed as well as blind and palsied, that thou knowest not that this is a merry-making, and not a devil's sabbath? Back to thy utter, I say. These sacred precincts are no place for thee.' "'How is it speaks to me?' demanded the old hag, halting, and fixing her glazed eyes upon him. "'One thou hast much injured,' replied Nicholas. "'One into whose house thou hast brought quick-wasting sickness and death by thy infernal arts. One thou hast good reason to fear. For learn to thy confusion, thou damned and murderous witch, it is Nicholas, brother to thy victim, Richard Asherton of Downham, who speaks to thee.' "'I know none I have reason to fear,' replied Mother Chattox, "'especially thee, Nicholas Asherton. "'Thy brother were no victim of mine. "'Thou wert the gainer by his death, not I. "'Why should I slay him?' "'I will tell thee why, old hag. "'He was inflamed by the beauty of thy granddaughter, Nancy, here, "'and it was to please Tom Redfern, her sweetheart then, "'but her spouse since, that thou bewitched him to death.' "'That reason will not avail thee, Nicholas,' rejoined Mother Chattox, with a derisive laugh. "'If I had any hand in his death, it was to serve and pleasure thee, and that all men shall know if I am questioned on the subject. <laughs> Take me to the crosses, Nance.' "'Thou shalt not escape thus, thou murderous hag,' cried Nicholas, furiously. "'Nay, let her go her way,' said Richard, who had drawn near during the colloquy. "'No good will come of meddling with her.' "'Who was that?' asked Mother Chattox quickly. "'Master Richard Asherton, a Middleton,' whispered Nan Redfern. Oh, "'Another of them cursed Ashertons,' cried Mother Chattox. "'The plague saves them.' "'Well, he's well favoured and kindly,' remarked her granddaughter. "'Well favoured or not, kindly or cool, I hate them all,' cried Mother Chattox. "'To the crosses, I say.' But Nicholas placed himself in their path. "'Is it to pray to Beelzebub, thy master, thou wouldst go to the crosses?' he asked. "'That in thy way, pestilent fool!' cried the hag. "'Thou shalt not stir till I have had an answer,' rejoined Nicholas. "'They say those are runic obelisks, and not Christian crosses, and that the carvings upon them have a magical signification. The first it is averred is written o'er with deadly curses, and the forms in which they are traced, as serpentine, triangular, or round, indicate and rule their swift or slow effect. The second bears charms against diseases, storms, and lightning, and on the third is inscribed a verse which will render him who can read it rightly invisible to mortal view. Thou should be learned in such lore, old Pythoness, is it so? The hag's chin wagged fearfully, and her frame trembled with passion, but she spoke not. "'Have you been in the church, old woman?' interposed Richard. "'Aye, wherefore?' she rejoined. "'Someone has placed a cypress wreath on Abbot Pastew's grave. Was it you?' he asked. "'What? Hast thou found it?' cried the hag. "'It shall bring thee rare luck, lad, rare luck. Now let me pass.' "'Not yet,' said Nicholas, forcibly grasping her withered arm. The hag uttered a scream of rage. "'Let me go, Nicholas Asherton,' she shrieked. "'Or thou shalt rue it. Cramps and aches shall ring and rack thy flesh and bones. Fever shall consume thee. I you shall shake thee, shake thee, ha!' And Nicholas recoiled, appalled by her fearful gestures. "'You carry your malignity too far, old woman.' said Richard severely. "'And thou darest tell me so,' cried the hag. "'Set me before him, Nance, that I may curse him,' she added, raising her palsied arm. 
"'Yon cursed o'er much already, grandmother,' cried Nan Redfern, endeavouring to drag her away. But the old woman resisted. "'I will teach him to cross my path,' she vociferated, in accent shrill and jarring as the cry of the goat-sucker. "'Answer me is, it may be now, but he shall not be so long. The bloom shall fade from his cheek, the fire be extinguished in his eyes, the strength depart from his limbs. Sorrow shall be her portion who loves him. Sorrow and shame!' "'Horrible!' exclaimed Richard, endeavouring to exclude the voice of the crone, which pierced his ear like some sharp instrument. "'Ah, you fear me now! By this and this the spell shall work,' she added, describing a circle in the air with her stick, then crossing it twice, and finally scattering over him a handful of grave-dust, snatched from an adjoining hillock. "'Now lead me quickly to the smaller cross, Nance.' she added in a low tone. Her granddaughter complied, with a glance of deep compassion at Richard, who remained stupefied at the ominous proceedings. All was astir in an instant. Robin Hood and his merry men, with the Morris dancers, rushed out of their bowers, and the whole churchyard was in agitation. Above the din was heard the loud voice of Simon Sparshot, still shouting, "'A witch! A witch! Mother Chattox! Where?' Where? demanded several voices. Yonder, replied Nicholas, pointing to the further cross. A general movement took place in that direction, the crowd being headed by the squire and the beadle. But when they came up, they found only Nan Redfern standing behind the obelisk. Well, the devil is the old witch gone, Dick, cried Nicholas in dismay. I thought I saw her standing there with her granddaughter, replied Richard. "'But in truth I did not watch very closely.' "'Search for her! Search for her!' cried Nicholas. But neither behind the crosses, nor behind any monument, nor in any hole or corner, nor on the other side of the churchyard wall, nor at the back of the little hermitage or chapel, though all were quickly examined, could the old hag be found. On being questioned, Nan Redfern refused to say aught concerning her grandmother's flight or place of concealment. "'I begin to think there is some truth in that strange legend at the cross,' said Nicholas. "'Notwithstanding her blindness, the old hag must have managed to read the magic verse upon it, and so have rendered herself invisible. But we have got the young witch safe.' "'Yea, squire,' responded Sparshot, who had seized hold of Nance, "'who'll be safe enough?' "'Nan Redfern is no witch,' cried Richard Asherton authoritatively. "'No witch, Master Rutchard!' cried the beadle, in amazement. "'No more than any of these lasses around us,' said Richard. "'Release her, Sparshot!' "'I forbid him to do so till she has been examined,' cried a sharp voice. And the next moment Master Potts was seen, pushing his way through the crowd. "'So you have found a witch, my masters. I heard your shouts, and hurried on as fast as I could.' "'Just in time, Master Nicholas, just in time,' he added, rubbing his hands gleefully. "'Let me go, Simon,' besought Nance. "'No, no, lass, that munna be,' rejoined Sparshot. "'Help! Save me, Master Richard!' cried the young woman. By this time the crowd had gathered round her, yelling, hooting, and shaking their hands at her, as if about to tear her in pieces. But Richard Asherton planted himself resolutely before her, and pushed back the foremost of them. "'Remove her instantly to the abbey, Sparshot,' he cried, "'and let her be kept in safe custody till Sir Ralph has had time to examine her. Will that content you, masters?' "'No, no,' responded several rough voices. "'Swim her! Swim her!' "'Quite right, my worthy friends, quite right,' said Potts. "'Primo, let us make sure she is a witch. Secundo, let us take her to the abbey.' "'There can be no doubt of her being a witch, Master Potts,' rejoined Nicholas. "'Her old granddame, Mother Chattox, has just vanished from our sight.' "'Has Mother Chattox been here?' cried Potts, opening his round eyes to their widest extent. Uh, "'Not many minutes since,' replied Nicholas. "'In fact, she may be here still, for aught I know.' "'Here? Where?' cried Potts, looking round. "'You won't discover her for all your quickness,' replied Nicholas. 
She has rendered herself invisible by reciting the magical verse inscribed on that cross. Indeed, exclaimed the attorney, closely examining the mysterious inscriptions. What strange, uncouth characters! I can make neither head nor tail, unless it be the devil's tail, of them. At this moment a hoop was raised by Jem Device, who, having taken his little sister home, had returned to the sports on the green, and now formed part of the assemblage in the churchyard. Between the rival witch potentates, mothers Demdike and Chattox, it has already been said a deadly enemy existed, and the feud was carried on with equal animosity by their descendants. And though Jem himself came under the same suspicion as Nan Redfern, that circumstance created no tie of interest between them, but the contrary, and he was the most active of her assailants. He had set up the above-mentioned cry from observing a large rat running along the side of the wall. "'There goes!' whooped Jem. "'Toad witch! Shape of a rotten! Oh, no, no!' Half the crowd started in pursuit of the animal, and twenty sticks were thrown at it, but a stone cast by Jem stayed its progress, and it was instantly dispatched. It did not change, however, as was expected by the credulous hinds into an old woman, and they gave vent to their disappointment and rage in renewed threats against Nan Redfern. The dead rat was hurled at her by Jem, but missing its mark it hit Master Potts on the head, and nearly knocked him off the cross upon which he had mounted to obtain a better view of the proceedings. Irritated by this circumstance, as well as by the failure of the experiment, the little attorney jumped down, and fell to kicking the unfortunate rat, after which, his fury being somewhat appeased, he turned to Nance, who had sunk for support against the pedestal, and said to her, "'If you will tell us what has become of the old witch your grandmother, and undertake to bear witness against her, you shall be set free.' "'I am tell you now, mon,' replied Nance doggedly, "'put me to any trial you like, you shall not get a word from me.' "'That remains to be seen,' retorted Potts. "'But I apprehend we shall make you speak, and pretty plainly too, before we've done with you.' "'You hear what this perverse and wrong-headed young witch declares, masters?' he shouted, again clambering upon the cross. "'I have offered her liberty on condition of disclosing to us the manner of her diabolical old relative's evasion, and she rejects it.' An angry roar followed, mixed with cries from Jem Device of, "'Swema! Swema!' "'You had better tell them what you know, Nance,' said Richard, in a low tone, or I shall have difficulty in preserving you from their fury. "'I dare no, Master Richard,' she replied, shaking her head, and then she added firmly, "'I win her. Finding it useless to reason with her, and fearing also that the infuriated crowd might attempt to put their threats into execution, Richard turned to his cousin Nicholas, and said, "'We must get her away, or violence will be done.' "'She does not deserve your compassion, Dick.' replied Nicholas. She is only a few degrees better than the old hag who has escaped. Sparshot here tells me she is noted for her skill in modelling clay figures. "'Yea, that her be,' replied the broad-faced beadle. "'Her's unaccountable clever at that sort of work. A clay figure as big as a six-month span, fashioned it likeness of Father Grimble of Brackliff Lawn, as died last month.' were found in her cottage, and many others beside. Among them, a model of your lamented brother Squire Richard Asherton a Downham, which you had pulled off, and out pierced through and through with pins and needles. "'You're lying in your teeth, Simon Sparshot,' cried Nance, regarding him furiously. "'If the head were off, Simon, I don't see how the likeness to my poor brother could well be recognised," said Nicholas, with a half-smile. "'But let her be put to some mild trial. Wait against the church Bible.' "'Be it so,' replied Potts, jumping down. "'But if that fail, we must have recourse to stronger measures. Take notice that with all her fright she has not been able to shed a tear, not a single tear, a clear witch.' "'And scorn to weep for like a you,' cried Nance disdainfully, having now completely recovered her natural audacity." "'We will soon break your spirit, young woman, I can promise you,' rejoined Potts. As soon as it was known what was about to occur, the whole crowd moved towards the church porch, 
Nan Redfern walking between Richard Asherton and the beadle, who kept hold of her arm to prevent any attempt at escape, and by the time they reached the appointed place, Ben Bagley, the baker, who had been dispatched for the purpose, appeared with an enormous pair of wooden scales, while Samson Harrop, the clerk, having visited the pulpit, came forth with the church Bible, an immense volume bound in black with great silver clasps. "'Come, that's a good big Bible, at any event,' cried Potts, eyeing it with satisfaction. "'It looks like my honourable and singularly good Lord Chief Justice, Sir Edward Cook's learned institutes of the laws of England. Only that great legal tome is generally bound in calf, law calf, as we say. "'Large as the book is, it will scarce prove heavy enough to weigh down the witch, I opine,' observed Nicholas, with a smile. "'We shall see, sir.' replied Potts. We shall see. By this time, the scales having been affixed to a hook in the porch by Bagley, the sacred volume was placed on one side, and Nance was set down by the beadle on the other. The result of the experiment was precisely what might have been anticipated. The moment the young woman took her place in the balance, it sank down to the ground, while the other kicked the beam. "'I hope you are satisfied now, Master Potts,' cried Richard Asherton. "'By your own trial her innocence is approved.' "'Your pardon, Master Richard. This is Squire Nicholas's trial, not mine,' replied Potts. "'I am for the ordeal of swimming. How say you, Masters? Shall we be content with this doubtful experiment?' "'No, no,' responded Jem Device, who acted as spokesman to the crowd. "'Swimmer! Swimmer!' "'I knew you would have it so,' said Potts, approvingly. "'Where is a fitting place for the trial?' "'There be pools now far off,' replied Jem, "'or you can take her to the colder.' "'The river, by all means, nothing like a running stream,' said Potts. "'Let cords be procured to bind her.' "'Run for em quickly, Ben,' said Jem to Bagley, who was very zealous in the cause. "'Oh!' groaned Nance again, losing courage, and glancing piteously at Richard. "'No outrage like this shall be perpetrated,' cried the young man firmly. "'I call upon you, Cousin Nicholas, to help me. Go into the church,' he added, thrusting Nance backward, and presenting his sword at the breast of Jem Device, who attempted to follow her, and who retired muttering threats and curses. "'I will run the first man through the body who attempts to pass.' As Nan Renford made good her retreat, and shut the church door after her, Master Potts, pale with rage, cried out to Richard, A "'You have aided the escape of a desperate and notorious offender, actually in custody, sir, and have rendered yourself liable to indictment for it, sir, with consequences of fine and imprisonment, sir, heavy fine and long imprisonment, sir. Do you mark me, Master Richard?' "'I will answer the consequences of my act to those empowered to question it, sir,' replied Richard sternly. "'Well, sir, I have given you notice,' rejoined Potts. "'Due notice. We shall hear what Sir Ralph will say to the matter, and Master Roger Nowell, and—' "'You forget me, good Master Potts,' interrupted Nicholas, laughingly. "'I entirely disapprove of it. It is a most flagrant breach of duty. Nevertheless, I am glad the poor wench has got off.' "'She is safe within the church,' said Potts, "'and I command Master Richard, in the King's name, to let us pass. "'Beadle, Sharpshot, Sparshot, or whatever your confounded name, "'do your duty, Sarah. Enter the church and bring forth the witch.' "'Ah, dear no, master,' replied Simon, "'young Master Richard has slipped my ways and as so as look at me.' "'Richard put an end to further altercation by stepping back quickly.' locking the door, and then taking out the key, and putting it into his pocket. "'She is quite safe now,' he cried, with a smile, at the discomfited lawyer. "'Is there no other door?' inquired Potts of the beadle, in a low tone. "'Yeah, there be one at t'other side,' replied Sparshot. "'But it be locked, I reckon, and maybe you have gotten out that way.' "'Quick, quick, and let's see,' cried Potts. "'Justice must not be thwarted in this shameful manner.' While the greater part of the crowd set off after Potts and the beadle, Richard Asherton, anxious to know what had become of the fugitive, and determined not to abandon her while any danger existed, unlocked the church door, and entered the holy structure, followed by Nicholas. On looking around, Nance was nowhere to be seen, 
Neither did she answer to his repeated calls, and Richard concluded she must have escaped, when all at once a loud exulting shout was heard without, leaving no doubt that the poor young woman had again fallen into the hands of her captors. The next moment a sharp, piercing scream in a female key confirmed this supposition. On hearing this cry, Richard instantly flew to the opposite door, through which Nance must have passed, but on trying it he found it fastened outside, and filled with sudden misgiving, for he now recollected leaving the key in the other door, he called to Nicholas to come with him, and hurried back to it. His apprehensions were verified. The door was locked. At first Nicholas was inclined to laugh at the trick played on them, but a single look from Richard checked his tendency to merriment, and he followed his young relative, who had sprung to a window, looking out upon that part of the churchyard whence the shouts came, and flung it open. Richard's egress, however, was prevented by an iron bar, and he called out loudly and fiercely to the beadle, whom he saw standing in the midst of the crowd, to unlock the door. "'Have a little patience, good Master Richard,' replied Potts, turning up his provoking little visage, now charged with triumphant malice. "'You shall come out presently. We are busy just now, engaged in binding the witch, as you see. Both keys are safely in my pocket, and I will send you one of them when we start for the river, good Master Richard. We lawyers are not to be overreached, you see. Ha! "'You shall repent this conduct when I do get out,' cried Richard furiously. "'Sparshot, I command you to bring the key instantly.' But encouraged by the attorney, the beadle affected not to hear Richard's angry vociferations, and the others were unable to aid the young man if they had been so disposed, and all were too much interested in what was going forward to run off to the vicarage and acquaint Sir Ralph with the circumstances in which his relatives were placed, even though enjoined to do so. On being set free by Richard, Nance had flown quickly through the church and passed out at the side door, and was making good her retreat at the back of the edifice, when her flying figure was described by Jem Device, who, failing in his first attempt, had run round that way, fancying he should catch her. He instantly dashed after her with all the fury of a bloodhound, and being possessed of remarkable activity, speedily overtook her, and heedless of her threats and entreaties, secured her. "'Let me go, Jem!' she cried, and I wouldn't do thee a good turn one of these days when thou might chance to be in the same strait as me. But seeing him inexorable, she added, My grandam shall rack thy bones sorely, lad, for this. Jem replied by a coarse laugh of defiance, and dragging her along, delivered her to Master Potts and the beadle, who were then hurrying to the other door of the church. To prevent interruption, the cunning attorney, having ascertained that the two Ashertons were inside, instantly gave orders to have both doors locked, and the injunctions being promptly obeyed, he took possession of the keys himself, chuckling at the success of the stratagem. "'A fair reprisal,' he muttered. "'This young milksop shall find he is no match for a skilful lawyer like me. Now, the cords, the cords!' It was at the sight of the bonds, which were quickly brought by Bagley, that Nance uttered the piercing cry that had roused Richard's indignation. Feeling secure of his prisoner, and now no longer apprehensive of interruption, Master Potts was in no hurry to conclude the arrangements, but rather prolonged them to exasperate Richard. Little consideration was shown the unfortunate captive. The new shoes and stockings, of which she had been so vain a short time before, were torn from her feet and limbs by the rude hands of the remorseless Jem and the beadle and bent down by the main force of those two strong men, her thumbs and great toes were tightly bound together, crosswise, by the cords. The churchyard rang with her shrieks, and with his blood boiling with indignation at the sight, Richard redoubled his exertions to burst through the window and fly to her assistance. But though Nicholas now lent his powerful aid to the task, their combined efforts to obtain liberation were unavailing, and with rage almost amounting to frenzy, Richard beheld the poor young woman borne shrieking away by her captors. Nor was Nicholas much less incensed, and he swore a deep oath, when he did get at liberty, that Master Potts should pay dearly for his rascally conduct. End of chapter 5